tuning in. Um, this is the first time we've done this, so uh, there may be some hiccups at least from your presenters, but I'm sure the technology will be fine. Um, with that, I will, <laughs> I will turn it over to Alton Byers. Alton is uh, one of the leaders of the High, Mount, High Mountain Adaptation Partnership, which formed out of some work that we did with the State Department um, following the Copenhagen uh, Climate Conference 2010. Ten, um, and we form the adaptation partnership to uh, focus on activities, action that was actually taking place around adaptation, and to bring together practitioners to learn from one another. And one of the activities that we pulled together was a, a wonderful um, trek where we brought Peruvian engineers to Nepal to share what Peru has learned in managing glacier lakes. Um, and Alton's going to talk a bit about that and some other things, and then. John Harlan is going to talk about another partnership that has spun out of this High Mountain partnership that has spun out of the Adaptation Partnership. So with that, over to Alton. OK, well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for coming uh, today. Uh, John and I would like to talk about the High Mountains Adaptation Partnership, uh, funded by USAID and implemented by the Mountain Institute and also the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I use the term high mountains rather loosely. Um, geographers have been arguing about this for 300 years. You know, what is a mountain? Uh, to me, it's uh, a glaciated landscape above 4,000, 5,000 meters. I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, according to a recent study, about 800 million people live in glacial landscapes such as this. Uh, and um, glacial landscapes occur in, in, in about 50 countries uh, throughout the world. They cover about 25% of the Earth's surface. And even though only 800 million people live here, we have to understand that these people are the stewards of the e uh, e ecological services that billions of people downstream uh, depend on. So these are quite uh, important ecosystems. They, a lot of people look at a mountain like this, like Taboche, and John Furlow was with us here a couple of couple of years ago, and they say, wow, you know, mountains are so big, they must be indestructible. And the exact opposite is true. They're actually among the most fragile landscapes in the world. And at the same time, they have undergone tremendous changes related to climate in the last 50 years, uh, uh, in ice, especially in glaciers. Mountains are the best barometer, sort of the canaries in the coal mine of, of climate change. This ice, these are photographs taken in the 1950s in the Mount Everest area, like these pinnacles in the Kumbu Glacier. They're vastly diminished in size uh, as a result of, of warming trends. One of the ways we can illustrate this very quickly is through a very simple technique using repeat photography. We just take photographs of the old climber scientists like Erwin Schneider, the guy with the great hair off to the right, and um, go back and replicate the photograph. Uh, Schneider worked in the Cordillera Blanca in Peru uh, back in the 1930s. This was taken in 1933. He was a, uh, an alpinist and also a cartographer. But then he went to Nepal in the 1950s, where he worked for about five years producing the beautiful Alpen Berenskart maps. So he's been in both of our projects. Areas. Another person I'd like to tell you a story about is Hans Kinzel, sitting down on the left. He was the leader of these expeditions. And when he left in 1939 to go back to Austria, he, he warned the government that Hakokocha Lake above the city of Huaraz was in danger of bursting. It was a large glacial lake. Two years later, the lake burst and killed 6,000 people in Huaraz. In 1969, there were two American geologists who warned the government that there was a huge mass of ice on the north face of, of Huascaran that was in danger of dislodging and creating a huge debris flow that could be catastrophic. One year later, in 1970, there was the tragic Huascaran earthquake. That large piece of ice indeed dislodged, created a huge debris flow that buried the town of Yungai. Between five and 15,000 people were killed within 15 minutes. In other words, we know these things are going to happen. We can predict that these sorts of uh, catastrophes will happen. We just don't know when. 
the second point is that we start, we're starting to learn that while we may know something about the science and the engineering, we haven't been paying enough attention to uh, the vulnerability, the human aspects of catastrophic events that could have let us save lives. Let's take a, qu a look very quickly at what some of the changes have been in the last 50 years in the Kumbu. We know for one thing that small glaciers at the lower elevations, hundreds of them, uh, have disappeared. They just seem to be especially vulnerable to the impacts of, of warming, and they're gone. We can see this on satellite photographs. We can see it on repeat photography. Aspect plays a key role in what's happening in these mountain areas. This is Everest and Nupse back in the 1950s. These are those ice pinnacles that you saw earlier, the dwarf man standing next to them. Look down here. They're vastly, vastly diminished in size. And one of the reasons for that is aspect. These are south-facing slopes. So aspect plays a key role in what is happening to these glaciers. Likewise, on north-facing slopes, this is Ama de Blam, we can see that the glaciers have been a little more insulated. It's, uh, the environments are colder. This equilibrium line really hasn't changed that much in the last 50 years because temperatures are above freezing year-round. So everything is different. Jeff Cargill and I published a paper in PNAS a couple years ago entitled Himalayan Glaciers, the big picture is the montage. Well, what we mean by that is picture of this glacier or take this glacier, everything is different. They're all acting differently. You know, they're not going to be go all gone in 2035. Many glaciers up there are debris covered. When a glacier begins to stagnate, as these glaciers have since the end of the, little, the last uh, the Little Ice Age in 1850, they become covered with debris. If the debris is thick enough, it can act as an insulation against further melting. So we can see a few new glacial meltwater ponds forming, but this glacier in particular has been rather buffered uh, against some of these warming trends. If that debris is thin, such as on this glacier, the exact opposite happens. The debris can be warm, is normally warm during the day. That heat is transferred directly to the ice, and that accelerates uh, uh, glacial recession. Something else that I find really interesting is how our attitudes have changed uh, in, the, in the last 50 years. When Fritz Muller, a uh, Swiss-Canadian glaciologist, stood here in 1956 with his theodolite, according to my advisor, Jack Ives, who knew him quite well, the biggest thing Fritz was worried about was the return of a little ice age. He was worried that once again glaciers would come plummeting down the valleys, destroying everything in their path, and actually the exact opposite happened. I found this next photograph of Fritz last night. I thought I'd throw it in. He's with the uh, Tengboche Rinpoche. Uh, back in 1956, the Rinpoche was only 14 years old then. Last month, we had a splendid interview with him. He's about, he's about 80 years old now, uh, while I was working with a French uh, TV crew on a, on a new climate change film. And uh, we asked him, why is climate change happening? And, and he said, well, one of the reasons is that nobody respects nature anymore. You know, there's some real parallels here. Now, by the time I got there, as I said, everything had changed. Uh, what had been a glacier when Fritz Muller was there, like the Imja Glacier, was now a large and potentially dangerous glacier. I started working with John Furlow. I think it was in 2007, and we started raising funds in earnest in 2008 for the first of our, a series of uh, glacier workshops, this one called Adapting to a World Without Glaciers. It was one of, the, one of the first interdisciplinary glacial workshops that I'm aware of that embraced both the physical and the social sciences. And one of the recommendations uh, over the course of the week of field and conference activities was that we hold the next one in Nepal. So we got busy again raising funds from the National Science Foundation and from USAID and State Department and UNDP, and indeed launched the Andean Asian Glacial Lake Expedition in September of 2011. We had 35 scientists from 15 different countries 
uh, including specialists from Peru with, many, with decades of experience in, in glacial lakes, to examine this particular lake. It's known as Imja Lake. It was the one I showed you earlier that was a glacier only um, uh, 50 years ago. And when I say glacial lake, what I mean is the glacier has receded uh, back to here, leaving, leaving behind uh, a large lake, which is contained by a terminal moraine. In this case, it consists of unconsolidated material, so there's really not much holding back what we found to be about 60 million cubic meters of water. To trigger an outburst flood, you can have a debris flow or an earthquake or a landslide, but nine times out of 10, they happen because a large mass of ice uh, perched on a mountain such as this, North Chamlung, is dislodged and falls into the lake, creates a surge wave that breaches the terminal moraine, and then you have millions of cubic meters of water cascading uh, downstream, causing great devastation. This uh, happened in 1998, and you can still see the, uh, the effects of this. They can take out bridges, uh, hydropower plants, and as we know, kill thousands of so now we're ready for the first video. John and I uh, debated what to show you. We have a range that we could choose from. I'll put this up later. You can see all of the different videos we've produced of our, our expedition field research these different websites. Or this was made by my on Daniel from uh, Skyship Films. Uh, it was an expedition with and about a lake we actually discovered that was uh, in Nepal that nobody knows about. See it from their, their satellite images. Uh, but a lot of the ideas for the IMAP project came from this expedition and we thought you'd like to see it. So we'll start with this. เมื่อเลวันดูดีนาเลวันดูมีร่างกายตาเกะกุเรสัมปีรีรีเรสัมปีรีรีเรสัมปีรีรีเรสัมปีรีรีเรสัมปีรีรีเรสัมปีรีร
factors that have us concerned. Number one, it's a very deep lake. You can tell that by the color. Number two, it's got an active and a calving glacier. Sometimes the masses of ice can calve off, and in the past, they have been enough to uh, induce a, a catastrophic outburst flood. Number three, the item that is <clears throat> of most concern is the fact that we have these huge masses of ice perched precariously on the north slopes of Chumlung. Now, all it would take, just like the Tamapokuri in the Hinku Valley 10 years ago, would be an earth tremor or gravity or continued warming trends to send one or more of these huge masses of ice plummeting into the lake that would cause the swell that would breach our fourth item of concern, which is the terminal moraine over here to my right, which is very, very small, and it's all that's holding in these millions and millions of cubic meters of water. This lake definitely is a high priority lake. It needs much more study, but I would say that of all the lakes in the Hongu Valley, this is the one that if any are going to burst in the near future, it's going to be this one. This is the one that's really virtually a time bomb. We plan to walk down the entire length of the Hongu River to its confluence with the Dudkosi River, about 100 kilometers uh, south of here. About 40 kilometers downstream, we'll start meeting the first villages and infrastructure. We're just curious to see what would be in the way of a catastrophic glacial lake outburst flood should it happen. Now, this trip has only been attempted two times or so in the last 50 or 60 years, and both expeditions got lost and nearly starved to death. Erwin Schneider in 1962, for example, uh, got lost towards the end of his cartographic expedition, and they were forced to eat the leather headbands, or tump lines, of the Nepali Namlos, uh, just to stay alive before they found their way out. So we have a rye shepherd as a guide. He's been up here many times with his flocks of sheep over the years. Uh, he knows the way, so I think we'll be okay. Nevertheless, we plan on taking a good supply of headbands and belts and leather boots. One of the, thing, the things we tried to incorporate in uh, our Glacial Lake work I'll talk about in, in a moment is including local people. They've often felt left out of the dialogue. For 30 years, people have been coming up studying these lakes uh, and never sharing the results with them. It's also interesting to see that the approaches that we've been developing or using over the last couple of years are now being endorsed in the peer-reviewed literature. I, I just a chapter of a new book by Wilfred Haverly, uh, and their position is that you have to use three things to effectively reduce the risk of these catastrophic uh, glacial cryospheric hazards. One is you have to do the science. You have to know, know the science. Two, you have to know what the engineering solutions are. And number three, you have to include what we've always neglected, which is an understanding of the socioeconomic vulnerabilities of people or that, and these events happen, people get, get killed. Um, so including people is very, very important. Let me just show you quickly some of the uh, techniques we used. We um, developed something we call the Glacial Lake Rapid Reconnaissance Team. And in this case, we're using ground-penetrating radar to see what's underneath the terminal moraine, which is very important because on this Imja Glacial Lake, in fact, it's cored by ice. That means that if you try and lower this lake, as the Peruvians have done successfully, because their terminal moraines uh, are not ice cored. You can just dig a channel and lower it, siphon it. I'll, I'll show you that process in a moment. 
But if you decide to start digging a channel to lower this glacial lake, you could hit ice. And that ice could melt, and you could actually start a glacial lake outburst flood. Cesar Portacarero, uh, who is an engineer with 40 years of experience, will speak briefly about this in the next video. Another uh, tool we use is um, a bathymetric surveys. Uh, basically, you do a transect of the lake using sonar to develop what's essentially a uh, topographic map of the lake and you can determine what the volume is. The results in this case was we found that the lake was about 20 meters deeper than previous studies had reported and twice the volume. Every paper reported that there was uh, uh, 30 million cubic meters. In fact, there's 60 million cubic meters of water in this lake. And that's the factor that has our engineers worried. It's, there's no overhanging ice. It's just the sheer volume of water and this unstable uh, terminal moraine. Local people suggested, hey, why not complete this uh, old terminal moraine that's, that's been eroded by the stream and, and build a dam so that if there were a glacial lake outburst flood, uh, a lot of it would be buffered by uh, going into this basin. So that's, that's one idea that, that uh, uh, Dane McKinney and Cesar Portacarero pursued further. They recommend that what we need to do at this particular lake is what they've done down in Peru, and that's to use siphons to lower the water. So we'll see this in action in, in a couple of minutes. But you lower it three meters, uh, excavate very carefully, lower it three more meters, excavate until you get down to the level that you consider will reduce the risk. Then what the University of Texas did was to put all this together and model, OK, under different scenarios, uh, how you could reduce the risk. And basically, all this is, is showing is that if you lower the lake by three meters, which is what our good friends at the UNDP are proposing to do, you have about a 5% reduction in risk. So as Dane McKinney says, you're wasting your time. You know, just go home. But if you lower it 20 meters, you're starting to get up into a more effective uh, risk reduction level. And then you can play around with these if you build a dam 20 meters, 40 meters, lower it, lower it 20, start getting up into significant risk reduction scenarios. But that's how we go about determining what needs to be done uh, at a particular glacial lake. Sharing the results for, with local people, that's uh, Dane McKinney from the University of Texas. Again, is very, very important. The next step, or the third step, and what we've just finished is the local adaptation plan of action. Uh, a series of community consultations over the last year using uh, about up to 11 different tools to come up with an adaptation uh, plan, both in Nepal and in Peru. Uh, this will be available online at one of our uh, resource documents that I'll mention. It's interesting the differences between Nepal and Peru in terms of what the priorities were. Uh, in Nepal, people are, in the Khumbu area anyway, they're scared to death of glacial lake outburst floods. They want something done about, the, about those. Landslides are increasing in frequency. Again, we think it's related to changes in precipitation patterns. It's a big concern about those. I'm sorry. Um, what do we have? Windstorms. No one has experienced the windstorms that are now happening over there in anybody's lifetime. Um, floods, of course, are absolutely devastating. A flood doesn't just happen and, it, and you, know, you go home. Its effects linger for years and years. Anyway, that's the Nepal list, where the Peru list was much more strongly focused on water. And fresh water supply, water for irrigation, water for power generation. And we think one of the reasons is that people don't use glac glacial water in the Khumbu for drinking but they do use it for drinking uh, and irrigation in, in Peru. Another component that we've been very pleased with is what we call the Climber Scientist Grant Program. Um, this gives uh, grants that, that in the first phase range from 25,000 to 100,000 uh, to researchers, primarily young men and women, uh, graduate students, in an effort to get them to well, you don't have to be a climber to get a climber scientist grant. All that means is we're trying to encourage a new generation of young men 
and young women to be as fluent in the laboratory, okay, with computer skills and modeling skills as they are uh, in the field with traditional field techniques. So we've had a lot of uh, a tremendous success with these grants. And we got some great news yesterday that there will be a phase two um, starting this spring sometime. This uh, one of our grantees is a. Uh, uh, Uliana Hrodiski, she has been doing pioneering work in um, uh, figuring out why some glaciers are turning into lakes and, and others are not, what the different factors are. And she was with me last month when uh, I was working with the TV film cream, a crew to make a new film called Planet Ice. It'll be, um, it's basically about what's happening to high altitude glaciers in the Everest region, the Andes, and, and other areas. It'll be screened in 33 countries and available this, this spring uh, uh, sometime. We also put a, have put a great uh, deal of emphasis on South-South collaboration and exchange, primarily because um, it's just the logical thing to do. The Peruvians have more than 70 years of experience in controlling and reducing the risk of dangerous glacial lakes. So as John said, we brought Cesar Portocarrero and other uh, Peruvian colleagues over to Nepal to work with their Nepali and Bhutanese and Indian colleagues. And just last summer brought the Nepalis and Bhutanese uh, back to uh, Peru. We made a big effort to capture the lessons learned. Um, this is a, was a project that was com combined with HiMap and other partners, partners, university partners. But we published a new mountain geography textbook um, just last November. And we're in the process right now of, um, uh, of having it published in Nepal, so it's not so expensive. It's about $100 a copy here, but we can get it published in Nepal for about $3 a copy. Uh, so we're, we're doing that, and then hopefully get it translated and published into Spanish as well as into, uh, into Russian. This is a new book by the National Geographic, where we wrote a chapter about the natural history of the Everest area. It was actually the because of this book that John Harlan came up with the idea of the Everest Alliance that he'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we were featured in Discover Magazine uh, for our Glacial Lake uh, work in June. It's very important to get results into the peer-reviewed literature. Um, I, I, as I said, I reviewed a paper last week about papers written about adaptation in, in glacial glaciated landscapes. And it turns out that. 60% of the countries with glaciers have nothing published. Okay, So we really need to make an effort to publish the results of whatever it is we're learning and getting it out there in the literature so that everyone from the field practitioner to the policymaker can use it. We worked with uh, Ed Douglas of the UK Guardian to write a piece about the effects of climate change on tourism which is a topic of great interest to people all, all over the world because tourism is, is so vital to uh, economies, especially mountain economies. Uh, Jack Leslie, this is now an e-book available online, but, but it's a story about uh, the experience in Bhutan in uh, lowering glacial lakes. And the National Geographic article was summarized in last summer's or, uh, or last May's issue of Natural History. So making an effort to capture the results of our work. Let me speak now next very quickly about change in the Kumbu and some of the uh, impacts of climate change. This is um, Namche Bazaar in 1973. I took the photograph as a 21-year-old uh, undergraduate. Here it is in 2008, okay, and here it is a couple of weeks ago. It's been a tremendous change in the cultural landscape because the Sherpas have once again transform themselves from agro-pastoralists into a tourist-driven economy. And a lot of people have gotten quite wealthy, but it has come at a, a cost. Okay, So for example, we're now creating the world's highest landfills. And the problem here is that these begin to represent stressors to climate change. This is a hazard to animals, to, to humans, to the environment, because this sort of burning of garbage in watercourses uh, contaminates the water. Likewise, when you have 36,000 tourists coming up a year, plus their, their porters and support staff, and you start building these outhouses over streams and in seasonal water courses, you get contaminated water. 
Things at the Everest base camp are in pretty good condition in terms of uh, waste management. Uh, one of my more um, important discoveries recently was figuring out what they they do with it. In fact, they take the human waste and they carry it about two hours down the trail, but then I found that they dump it in these huge pits in seasonal water courses. So if you're wondering why everybody is getting sick when they trek to the Everest base camp these days, it's because the water is contaminated and fresh water sources are drying up. Okay, and, uh, a num number one complaint of local people is they don't have enough fresh water. There's not enough for the household. There's not enough for the lodges who have additional demands because tourists want flush toilets and they want showers. Um, but what's inter interesting, this photo was taken just two weeks ago, is that people are already adapting to it. Uh, local people have gotten grants from the government of India, in this case, and they are piping in water from 10 kilometers away. It used to be they would get the water just you know, five minutes from their village. But they are adapting. They're stringing this pipe over eight or 10 kilometers. That's the trail that goes up to the water intake of the Kyalo Glacier. So it, it's important to know people are adapting. They're just going to extreme measures to do so. We, we didn't have to do this uh, 10 years ago. OK. We can help people deal with a number of these uh, projects through a new initiative that John Harlan uh, came up with called the Everest Alliance. And I'm going to turn it over to him right now. This is like a sub-project of the uh, HiMap project. Yeah, um, the Everest Alliance actually, is this? I don't hear. OK, it comes and goes. Um, the, um, after. A friend of mine, Mark Jenkins, published an article in National Geographic last May that was called How to Fix the Mess on Everest, because there's been so much publicity to the high mountain and the crowds and some of the bottlenecks and the bodies on all these problems. And he pointed to some solutions. And, and I read the article and thought, uh, well, there's so many more even than what he pointed to. And it seemed like all of these things can be addressed if people just work together. It just takes getting together and solving them. I can think of various really other people can think of a lot more. So I called him up, and we talked about it for quite a while. And then I said, well, wouldn't the Mountain Institute be the perfect organization for putting this together? Uh, some kind of alliance around Everest that would come up with these cooperative ways of solving problems. And he thought it definitely would. I mean, the, the Mountain Institute has been working in this area since the um, late 80s. Anyway, or a bit earlier, actually. But in the late 80s, they uh, put together uh, new national parks that actually surround Mount Everest. Sagamartha National Park was already there for the Kumbu, the part that you've seen here already. That Makalubarun National Park was founded by the Mountain Institute, and, th and that's to the southeast of the Massif. And then the northern side, the Tibetan side, Chumalungma Nature Preserve, was also founded by the Mountain Institute. And it's all based on working cooperatively with the people. And that's the essential thing, is the, the local buy-in so that the solutions are coming from them, or at least um, fully accepted and embraced by them. And so we decided that. Yes, it would be the right thing to do. And I uh, spoke with it with Alton. We just started working together on, on HiMap. And so it, we've been very fortunate that um, USAID agrees that this is something that can come out of our High Mountains Adaptation Partnership um, with a little seed grant that they've given us to get going. The, this is the Kumbu Alpine Conservation Council that was founded by the Mountain Institute um, about a decade ago and has played a big role in preserving a lot of uh, the juniper landscape and a lot of the environmental issues in this particular area. And so they held this, these meetings there, and they decided that, yes, this notion of the Everest Alliance was a great one. They formally founded it themselves, and they invited us to be the worldwide outreach for it. And so that process is just beginning now. Actually, Alton and I are going out to the Outdoor Retailer Trade Show next week. And this is when we're going to be introducing the concept to the outdoor industry. 
who we want to very much involve with solving the problems up there. And we had meetings with um, National Geographic Society day before yesterday. And they are very eager to come on board to be a major media partner to finally give back to this mountain that has meant so much to Geographic over the years. They were the major sponsor of the first American expedition in 63. And so it's, it's all starting here, and it's working together to resolve these issues. It'll be embracing the mountain so that we're actually harnessing the, the fame. I mean, the initial idea came out of the mess that's above base camp. And it might seem that that doesn't have too much to do with most of the environmental issues that we deal with here. But some of it is. There's waste management issues. But mostly, it's fame that can be harvested. And a lot of people who are interested in that mountain who will give, if it were the Kumbu Alliance, they'd say, what's that? And wouldn't have much interest. But if it's the Everest Alliance, for example, um, the waste management issues, perhaps a company like Waste Management Incorporated um, would be interested in um, helping us come up with the Everest Prize for so the best solutions to some of these things and then award grants based on that. And then we'll take this model, assuming we can develop it properly, this model of cooperative problem solving and start applying it to other mountains around the world uh, afterwards. So that's what we're just initiating right now. Thank you very much, John. I forgot to mention that John is a um, uh, editor, a best-selling author, and the only movie star I've ever personally known. I think you've been in, you've been in two IMAX films, the one climbing the Iger with Conrad Unger. Yeah, OK. Um, and there are climate change components, uh, very strong climate change components to this initiative. One being the restoration of high altitude ecosystems. There's no better buffers against the impacts of climate change than a continuous cover of vegetation. So we take care of the landscape. It takes care of biodiversity and, and everything else. Other impacts, if you take a, the Sherpas have adapted time and again to change um, everything from the introduction of the potato to crossing a yak with a, a cow to get a zopkyo and becoming cattle kings, to developing trade with Tibet and getting wealthy. They just keep adapting. Um, but there's some real surprises. Now they are uh, specialists in tourism. Um, they're driven. Their economy is driven by tourism. What's happening because of climate change is the planes aren't flying as frequently as they used to do because the number of cloudy days has increased. If the planes don't fly, nobody works. Okay, So now they're looking at other solutions. They're thinking about even building a road up to this Mukla airstrip because nobody is able to get in or out anymore, unless you walk. Um, here's landslides. I mentioned that earlier. I've never, in all the decades I've worked in Nepal, heard people speak more uh, and with greater fear of, about landslides than now. And again, it, it's related. We know it's related somehow to the changes in precipitation patterns, more and heavier precipitation concentrated at one time uh, that used to be uh, more spread out. These processes seem to be accelerating. The top one is the uh, glacial terminus in May of 2012. And below, it, just three months later, you can see we lost about 200 meters of ice that calved off of that glacier, as opposed to what the literature was reporting, which was 35 meters a year. Now, it's not 35 meters a year anymore. It's like 200 meters a year. And we're not concerned only about existing dangerous glacial lakes, because new ones are forming. As we, as we speak right now. Those little meltwater ponds at this lake, that Ur, this glacier that Uliana is studying, were not there two years ago. And the same process that happened at Imja Lake is now being repeated uh, here. Those lakes will merge. They will turn into a larger lake. And you're looking at the next uh, potentially dangerous glacial lake in the Kumbu, unless we do something now, for example, you know, simple drainage. Here's a model uh, done by one of our colleagues. It's a Swiss glacier, but nevertheless, you can see this is what's happening as the glaciers recede, and could they create lakes, and then the lakes merge and turn into a potentially dangerous glacial lake. 
Okay, now we're going to do video number two. We're almost done. This is our third international glacier workshop. This time, uh, as I said earlier, we brought the Bhutanese and the Indians and the Nepalis over to Peru, uh, Cordillera Blanca, which we think is, is very much a uh, living laboratory to spend some time there. I like this video uh, a whole lot because it has a great, um, this is not working. Oh, here we go. Okay. Because there's uh, such an emphasis on south-south um, collaboration and exchange. This happened last July uh, down in the Cordillera Blanca. Climate change is driving a change in glaciers across the world, and we're kind of seeing changes in time. Glaciers all over the world are melting, but at different rates, and they've started melting more in some areas than in others. Peru has been dealing with melting glaciers for 50 years or more. It's a newer phenomenon in the Himalayas and newer still in the Pamirs and some of the other mountains in Central Asia. And so we have an opportunity for a group of people in the Andes who have had several decades of experience to take what they've learned and enable them to share their knowledge and their experience with the people of Nepal and Central Asia. So we've gathered a group of physical and social science researchers and development practitioners here in Huaraz. We've been able to hear from people both from the Andes, from the Himalaya Hindu Kush, as well as from Central Asia. USAID and the High Mountain Partnership have supported a climber scientist small grants program. We've been able to hear from each of the grantees about the work they've been doing over the last year. This workshop is very different from your typical workshop because we emphasize the field and field training so much. We want to get out of the conference room and into the field where the knowledge of our scientists and experts can be of real practical benefit to our participants as well as to local people and governments. We train participants in the use of ground penetrating radar on the 5300 meter Pastoruri Glacier to determine the glacier's mass and thickness that will allow us to calculate change over time. We learned about the impacts of receding glaciers on water quality and water supply for the city of Huaraz. And we also spent a day with local communities discussing the local adaptation plan of action that they're developing to buffer the impacts of climate change. Today we visited the valley of Kilkai, which is located above the city of Huaraz. And part of what we're doing is activities in order to build that bridge, communication bridge between scientists and communities. The involvement of local communities, local institutions is, is really key to, to attacking problems of, of possible glacier like outburst floods, of, of, of attacking risk in mountain areas. We know that the glaciers have been receding actually since the 1850s, which is the end of the Little Ice Age. So that's why in 1940 you had lakes, then in 1941 a glacial lake outburst that destroyed much of what else. Starting in 1970, 80, 90, and today it's accelerating again. One of the great things about this program is it brings together people from different disciplines and from different areas, from different countries, with people here from Nepal, from, from Central Asia, and they all have a different perspective on glacial lakes, on mountain risks, on, on management of mountain areas. And that is, I think, quite unique. This is my first time in the Andes, and I'm really surprised to see the communities which are so similar to the communities back in Nepal. Not only in terms of features, but also in terms of the lifestyles. Que también ellos de nuestros hermanos de Nepal están pasando también por esta desglaciación, ¿no? De sus nevados que tienen ellos, de sus montañas. Vemos con tanta extrañeza o tanta admiración de que Vemos de que nuestros glaciales están retrocediendo, desapareciendo. Yo creo que bastante significativo, porque en sí nosotros todavía no nos, no nos estamos dando cuenta de esto de lo que es el cambio climático. Y yo creo que es muy importante esto, doctor. 
tres burras por todos, pues. The last few days we're, we're going to trek up to Lake Palcacocha and we'll have an opportunity for hands-on learning led by the Peruvians that were in charge back then. Lake Palcacocha is one of the most dangerous lakes in the Cordillera Blanca which burst in 1941 and killed about 6,000 people just right down there. It's now about 34 times the size it was after it burst in 1941 and our model suggests that if it bursts again it's going to kill 30,000 people down there. So the risks and consequences have grown dramatically as the original dam built after the 1941 flood is now thought to be inadequate to the task of holding back the lake. We're going to go up to the lake where we will have the opportunity to learn from Cesar Portacarero, who was lead engineer on the Pauca project some 40 years ago. Cesar has managed 15 dangerous glacial lake projects in Peru and he's a priceless resource for our colleagues from the Himalaya and Central Asia. This dam that you see here was finished in 1974 and it was built when the lake had half million cubic meters but the current volume we could assume in more than 17 million cubic meters 34 times the volume that we had in 1974. We think that the the level of the lake has to be reduced in those 15 meters of the first 300 or 400 meters in this front part. So it's going to be a big work to protect the city of Carhuaz. This to do this, yes, but in Incha it's necessary to define the features, the characteristics, the structure of the moraine. Here we are, we are sure that there is not ice inside, but in Incha, as far as we know, there is ice in the moraine. We cannot excavate if there is ice, otherwise we could produce a glove. From this conference, I think it will help Nepal, Peru or uh, other countries to mitigate the risk and to save uh, people from the glove problem. Мы имеем те же самые проблемы, которые бывают в горных странах, такие как Непал, Перу, Пакистан. Инициатива. Мы не должны иметь границ в сфере науки, и все должно быть открыто для людей. So we've been able to see similar problems and also look at differences across the different regions. And the idea has been that we want to promote South-South learning. And so by bringing these people together, we're able to see what they've learned in Peru and begin sharing it and applying it in areas where the melting of glaciers is a bit newer.
take about 15 meters. So it's a really good feeling to think that perhaps we've played a role in saving about 30,000 lives. I'm going to end with some of our resources. These are all uh, up on the HiMap um, uh, web page. Our Kumbu Adaptation Plan of Action will be ready in about a month. The uh, Peru uh, LAPA will be ready as well. Uh, Adapt Asia Pacific funded Cesar to go over to Nepal about two or three times a year ago and do an assessment of the uh, new UNDP risk reduction project. Uh, that report is in its final review. Cesar wrote a handbook we're especially excited about. It's 18 case studies from the Cordillera Blanca of how the Peruvia Peruvians reduce the risk of lakes. They actually worked on 35 dangerous lakes, but this captures the 18 that he worked on which we think will be an invaluable resource for uh, dozens of countries around the world. We have our own uh, um, uh, policy brief uh, system that you, you can, uh, or series that you can see on the web page. And we don't just do glacial lakes. There'll be comparative uh, analyses of the Peru and Nepal Lapas, for example, and there are many others. So in conclusion, you know, for thousands of years, we've, ex uh, we've experienced, we've dealt with um, wars and droughts um, and uh, famines and avalanches, but we've never dealt with what we're experiencing now. That's these warming trends that are resulting in a new series of hazards, or, or such as glacial lakes or melting of, of permafrost. Um, but I think there's reason for a lot of hope. I think that the approach that I mentioned earlier of, of promoting a good scientific understanding of the problem, engineering solutions with a better incorporation of uh, people's vulnerabilities is a step in the right direction. Um, I really like the Climber Scientist program that we've launched. I think that giving young men and women the tools they need to solve these problems for future generations is one of the most effective things that we can do. And likewise, South-South collaboration and exchange there is so much that countries can learn from, uh, from each other if given the opportunity. So with that, I'll end and say thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for the presentation. I have a question about the siphoning of the lakes and the long-term management of those. So once you siphon them, there's no surface flow uh, to drain, to continue to drain the lake. I would imagine that they would just slowly rise again. Um, and, and so can you just speak a little bit about the long-term management required for these? Yeah, that, that's a very astute question because of uh, who started uh, lowering its glacial lakes, 35 different projects back in the 1950s. And things were relatively stable in the 50s, 60s, 70s. But now, with an acceleration of, uh, of, of melting, those measures are no longer adequate. So yes, you have to constantly monitor whatever engineering solution you put in, uh, because the ice is, is still melting. Um, Imja Lake, for example, some people think, well, may not be really dangerous now, but give it 10 more years. All right, so you constantly. Uh, what we're learning is you need to monitor whatever interventions you put in. In case you're interested in the process a little more, I just edited it. The standard thing. underneath the lake will be stabilized dam so something falls into it it would be captured are you building hydropower with those t uh, tunnels it has been done on uh, lake lake paron um, uh, it's uh, lake paron was lowered uh, and then they, Cesar drilled a thousand meter tunnel that then channeled the water, you know, uh, kept the lake at a safe level, but then that water is used for hydropower downstream. Yes? 
Hi, uh, I appreciated what you said about uh, the South to South community level uh, collaboration and chance for communities to, to talk to each other. But could you also say a little bit more about how this effort is uh, connecting with local and regional government authorities to be able to do things like uh, siphon the lake, get their agreement, get the money, and get these ideas about uh, glacier melt built into water management beyond the communities where, that are being directly affected? Yeah, well, there are two levels of answer to that question. Number one is, is how do you link local people and communities with governments so that they can access the funding that they need to implement the climate change adaptation priorities? And you know, that's mainstreaming. And what we're doing right now in Nepal and, uh, and in Peru is the next step is the implementation of the final three steps of the LAPA which is integration. We take the LAPA and we visit the VDC, the Village Development Committee, the District Development Committees, the buffer zones, the people who have funds, and try and get them to own this plan so that they incorporate the needs that were identified in the LAPA into their own development plans. Okay, um, Lowering glacial lakes, uh, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not an engineer. You know, I'm more of a, I'm a mountain geographer. I'm a, sort of enabler. Um, but it's, it's really very, very complex. Uh, there's only been one glacial lake, one attempt to lower a glacial lake in Nepal. That was Soropa. They lowered it. It was recommended to lower it by 20 meters. Two million dollars later, they lowered it three meters. They ran out of money and they went home. Um, Lowering lakes is going to be very, very difficult. And, and my take on that is there's going to become a day, there's going to come a day when people are just going to have to get out of, out of the way, OK? They're just, they're just too vulnerable. You can't, there's not enough money. It would cost millions and millions of dollars to lower these lakes because it takes you, you know, almost two week, uh, 10 days to get back there. And you're up at, you know, 5,400 meters. Um, so we're going to have to be very creative in our, in our solutions. I'm sorry I, I didn't answer your question. I don't know how they're going to get money. Yeah. That was a very creative way of giving people the mechanisms to access government government funding. Yes. Um, hello. Very interesting work. Um, from the Asian Development Bank, we're actually uh, implementing a project on climate resilience in Tajikistan. So I'm just curious as to what you're doing in Tajikistan, besides maybe some of these South-South dialogues. Are there any specific projects? No specific have? projects at, at this time, but pr we're promoting the South-South Dialogues. Musafar was with us uh, over in Imja Lake in 2011 and then down in Peru. He would very much like us to come to uh, Tajikistan. And if we can find the money, we will. You should stay in touch. Yes. Yeah, so the, well, Michael's question was, are IMAP doing anything in Tajikistan? And then Cody asked me to say something about, we're sending Dane McKinney, who's the bearded fellow who was in the videos, um, 
to a workshop that uh, BCS is putting on on glacier issues in April. So we'll have one of our high map reps that, and then our talking with two years about trying to multi-party workshops in Tajikistan. We haven't been able to pull it together. And now we're worried that my passport doesn't have enough time left to do a workshop and be able to follow on it. Talk about the back. I actually have a, a glaciologist on the project team. So. Thanks. It was a very appealing uh, presentation. And um, I noticed that, that you focus mostly on the high altitude impacts, which are visually very engaging and emotionally kind of engaging, too, because of the size of the community and the, the, um, the very um, concrete effect of the, uh, the of the potential disaster. But in your website, um, HiMap also talks about the management of the whole ecosystem, the whole watershed ecosystem, and the lowland up, uh, high, uh, upper altitude a relationship uh, and ecosystem services, and I, you know, if you're looking at uh, money and how to draw money into the process, the um, the effects on the uh, the downstream ecosystem, uh, the social impacts are going to be more widespread and generalizable. And does that not? I mean, does that not uh, give you the, present your program with some opportunities as well as some risks? Can you not draw because of that widespread interest? draw our resources back up to help work with the problem at that level. Yeah, we actually just finished a project. That we, we do that, too. Um, there was a, a USAID project that Jorge brought in about three, three or four years ago. It was called Peaks to Coast. And it was based on the highland, lowland interaction principle, Okay, that what you do in the highland affects what's happening down in the lowlands, and, and uh, as well as the the um, building a cadre, you know, of of uh, supporters down in the coastal areas and educating them about the importance of mountains. So yes, we have done that. Andrew, um, I'd, I'd just like to add one sort of uh, more sort of philosophical uh, issue related to this one, um, and it has to do with you know there are a lot of watershed management approaches around the world. Lots and lots of people are working on those issues. Um, you know, the Mountain Institute is particularly concerned about the high altitude issues because um, that's really uh, a sort of a niche that is really inadequately being addressed. And my, the sort of impression I have is that money flows downhill. So if you bite off the whole watershed, because of, of the many of the urban issues, poverty issues, those sorts of things that are happening downstream, once you start looking at the whole watershed, attention flows downstream so that the upper watershed issues very often get put aside because there's a whole set of things. And also it's the logistics. And you guys have sort of set a new standard. So much of mountain work in the has because of remote sensing and so on. Well, we can get at that through remote sensing approaches and that sort of thing. And you guys have shown that not only can you get much better information by actually getting there and on the ground, but also through engaging the local people at those high altitudes, we can get much better sort of um, assessment of what the potential response.